Once upon a time, it's a great way to start a story about exploration, about adventure. It's a traditional opening for a story about the past. Unfortunately, there's no traditional opening for a story about the future. I'm not quite sure why that is. It's not for a lack of stories. We have stories about the future that date back thousands of years. Now, I will admit those stories, when you hear them, sound a little more like fairy tales than reasoning about the future. The oracle at Delphi in the 6th century BCE was consulted by Croesus, who wanted to go to war against the Persians. And he asked the oracle what would happen if he attacked the Persians, and the oracle said, if you attack, a great nation will be destroyed. Croesus took that vision of the future, attacked the Persians, was handily defeated, and thus fulfilled the prophecy of the oracle that a great nation would be destroyed, namely his own. And we've come a long way in thinking about the future from that kind of uh, mixture of hallucinogens and ambiguous statements that were very common at the Oracle at Delphi. And as someone who works uh, in, the, in looking at the future, specifically the future of uh, technology and travel, I'm excited by the progress that we've made, mostly because it comes from so many different disciplines. You think about scientists, mathematicians, technologists, engineers, names like da Vinci and Einstein that uncover truths of their day, but also truths that would be revealed later, years later, decades later, sometimes centuries later. But it's not these select few that help shape the way that we think about the future. Also literature, H.G. Wells uh, created the time machine, invented it in 1895 at least invented it on paper. This is a rough representation of that from one of the movies about his book, which is aptly named The Time Machine. Before 1895, if you wanted to put one of your literary characters into the future, you just had them fall asleep for a really, really, really long time. And then they would wake up at some point in the future and explore a new world. But it's not just books, writers of television and movies influence the way that we think about the future uh, on an even growing basis. People within Google have not been shy about some of their goals being to actually implement technology that they see happening in Star Trek and other science fiction films. From other places, we see contributions to how we think about the future, from anthropology, architecture, and even from the academic community. In the 1940s, the coined futurology was coined, the term futurology was coined, and it was used to try to push the idea of studying the future, much like we study the past, into our core academics. Now, studying the future is kind of hard to be an exact science, so the uptake hasn't been huge. We're not sitting in the futurology department right now. But there are over a dozen universities that offer programs in future studies. Tampong University in Taiwan has incorporated it into their undergraduate program, making it part of their core curriculum. And many of you might be uh, interested to know that one of the longest running and most prestigious postgraduate programs in the study of the future is actually just a few miles down the road at the University of Houston. So when I see all of these different disciplines contributing to how we think about the future, I kind of have to ask myself, why? Right? Why not just wait for the future to go ahead and get here? I like this quote by Charlotte Gilman. It says, one of the most distinct features of the human mind is to forecast better things. Now, not everyone who thinks about and writes about the future is so utopian in what they think. Science fiction writer Ray Bradbury says, I don't try to predict the future, I try to prevent it. And thus this idea that we can somehow influence the future, which is part of one of the most famous futurism quotes. You know it's famous because it's attributed to lots of different people. Everybody from Abraham Lincoln to Alan Kay supposedly said, the only way to predict the future is to create it. And there's a certain draw to this idea that we can somehow wrestle the future to be what we want it to be. But I like the subtlety of Berta Jovenel, a French futurist who said, man is fortunate when the desirable and the probable coincide. The case is often otherwise. So we find ourselves trying to bend ourselves, uh, try to bend the course of events 
in a way that brings the probable closer to the desirable. And that is why we study the future. And Jovenel thought this habit of forward looking was very important. And I think so too, this practice, this way to pioneer change by spending time reasoning and thinking about the future, I think is a powerful endeavor. And I hope you leave here today excited about ways to do that. But first, before we go on that journey, some cautionary tales and warnings I have for you. The first is about time. Now, you may think it's fairly obvious that a tricky part of thinking about the future is thinking about time, and you'd be correct. But it's not so much time that trips people up. It's actually dates. So trying to peg a date to a vision of the future is not the friend of a forward-looking mind, I will say. Whether it's predicting the end of rock and roll or paper books or the end of the world itself, or on the other end, predicting a world where we're amongst flying cars and robotic maids, Great many a futurists have crashed on the shores of pinning their vision to a specific date. Even if you were to pick the right date for your vision of the future, most likely it would be attributed to luck once it finally got here, or even worse. Peter Drucker said that there's nothing as powerless as a prophet whose time has come. He no longer shocks. He can merely entertain. And so when thinking about trying to put dates to your vision of the future, just don't do it. Just don't. And if you really think you might want to do it, at least pick a date that occurs in your lifetime so that you'll be around to see whether it comes true or not and to reap either the benefits or the consequences of that prediction. We also have some more common warnings about exploring the future. Uh, that, Thinking about the future may cause dizziness, fatigue, uncertainty, loss of hair, may cause social awkwardness or loss of friends. In certain cases, thinking about the future may even cause a loss of sanity. If you feel yourself losing touch with reality, or if you have a forward-looking session lasting longer than four hours, please consult your physician immediately. And despite these warnings, I hope that you think this is still an endeavor worth pursuing, that thinking about the future is something that you can incorporate into your discipline, your field of study, your future. And I want to give you some tools to help you do that. The first is scenario building. So scenario buildings let us lay out possible futures and explore them individually so that we can explore things that are plausible and sometimes things that are almost impossible. We're going to go through a quick exercise today, something that was mentioned earlier, around autonomous vehicles and urban transportation. That's just a really fancy way of saying self-driving cars in the city. So we're going to talk about some different scenarios that I wrote on one of these airport napkins of uh, some scenarios that could uh, be true for self-driving cars in the city. Scenario one is that cars never reach full autonomy. So sometimes the boldest scenario you can make is the progress that you want to see doesn't actually happen. That you may see a scenario play out where uh, many of the features improve, but it never fully ejects the driver from the car scenario. Scenario two says that specialized cars are autonomous on current infrastructure. So there may be something, cost, patent, something that allows some cars, maybe public transportation, taxi services, to be self-driving, but not other vehicles, not all vehicles. The key here is that it's on the current infrastructure. We don't have to change our roads or our buildings for that scenario. Scenario three, we may not end up taking to our bosses, but cars don't reach autonomy, but are somehow remotely driven, kind of like we drive drones today, is that they're remote. This could be a possibility of the future. Four, specialized cars are autonomous on specialized infrastructure. This means not only do we have to put special technology in cars that may be expensive and only a few have them, but we also have to do something to our roads or our buildings or our city infrastructure to make that happen. And five is the scenario we all want to see all the cars are autonomous on the current infrastructure. Either they roll off the assembly line autonomous, or there's some add-on kits, kits you can put to your favorite car. And six, that even goes so far as to all non-autonomous transportation vehicles are outlawed. I don't know what this means for bicycles or pedestrians, but we'll have to explore that scenario by itself. So this isn't an exhaustive list. This is just an example of some ways we can think about possible futures of autonomous vehicles in an urban setting. And once we have these, we can dig deeper by exploring some of the enabling technologies that might be required for each scenario to play out. And enabling technology is an advancement, a change that has to happen for that scenario to come true. 
An example here, let's talk about scenario five, everyone's favorite, we're all not driving cars anymore, they're driving us around. Uh, the problem is, is that right now an Uber driver drives around 300 miles a day, and that's with a lot of human inefficiency. So if we had cars that drive themselves and drive themselves all day, and maybe these cars are electric, most electric cars can't run more than 250 miles on a given day. So we need better batteries. I don't know much about batteries, so I have to research how close is better battery technology? Is there some kind of Moore's law for batteries? There's not, I checked uh, earlier today. But that's something we have to explore. It's a leaping off point for our research. Maybe there's a way we can charge the cars as they move throughout the city. Maybe some kind of induction while, pe while cars are sitting at traffic lights. Do we even need traffic lights if we have autonomous cars? What kind of algorithms would we need to not have traffic lights? Let's set that one on the side and we'll keep talking about fuel empowering vehicles. So maybe battery technology isn't the way to go. Maybe we'll still use gasoline to drive these cars around, but I don't know how a self-driving car fuels itself at the pump. Um, are we gonna see a rise in full service gas stations again? What's, what's the autonomy around fueling vehicles now? Maybe we could look at uh, what different jet fighters are doing to fuel as they stay in the air. All of these things are ways to further explore a given scenario they give you leaping off points to take this scenario from kind of casual to really more reasoned. And the final thing that you can do with this, not final, but another, is once you find you have that rigor around one of your scenarios, exploring the competitive forces against that future. Now, some of these competitive forces are really obvious. In our self-driving car example, uh, taxi unions don't like the idea of cars driving themselves around. Okay, that's pretty obvious. But there are all, all kinds of non-obvious competitors to our versions of the future. John Naisbitt founded a whole company around taking papers, newspapers, local newspapers from across the nation, assembling them and spotting trends in what they cover, and then reporting those trends back to hopefully predict what's happening in the United States. Use a paper newspaper because it's a system that's a closed system. There's only a certain amount of paper they produce every day. And so a story that goes in means a story has to come out. What he found is that some causes, some things compete with each other, not because they're explicitly competitive, but because they compete for our attention, they compete for talent, they compete for funding. He saw that in the 1970s, that as environmentalism was gaining attention, civil rights issues were waning in the papers. A rise and increase in our awareness of environmentalism meant that we were talking less about civil rights issues in the papers. And so your version of the future may face competition that's not direct at it, but indirect. In our autonomous vehicles discussion, while I'm excited about our uh, renewed vigor to explore space, in our current environment of finite attention, talent, and funding, does that somehow compete with my version of the future of self-driving cars? And so in just a few minutes, right, we've gone from casually talking about cars that drive themselves around cities to being able to have some jumping off points to research and really understand what it might look like for this future to come true. And I hope that you see it's not just self-driving cars or technologies, but it's, it's anything that we do today that you think extends out to the future. It's your job, it's your discipline, it's the things that are happening around you. And I hope that you're inspired by the mental explorers of the past and of the present to take up this practice, this habit of forward looking. Um, author Bruce Sterling said, the years to come are not merely imaginary, right? They are history that hasn't happened yet. That's why this is important. And so I hope that with you, when you look back on this future history, that it could be said of you that once upon a time, there was a forward thinker, a thinker not limited by the certainty of the past or distracted by the busyness of the present, but bold enough to venture into the future. Using tools of reason and avoiding common missteps was able to envision a world made better a future that we could all work towards and live happily ever after. Thank you.